Hello and welcome to Season 4 of the Sunday Podcast, presented by SportsShoes.com. I'm Ollie Lum. And I'm Matt Seddon. This podcast is all about elite distance running in the UK. We're here to give you all the latest news updates around the sport. As well as weekly interviews with athletes and coaches. Stay up to date by following us on Instagram and X at Sunday Podcast. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel too, where we post athlete workout videos, shoe reviews and more. Thanks for listening. And as always, we hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, welcome back to another episode. As you can see from the title, Mr. Alex Botterill is joining us later on. Um, won't get too much into it now, but it was a great episode, wasn't it, Matt, seeing as we've just finished recording. Um, but how are you, mate? First of all, you're coming off your, your junior to senior camp. Very good, mate. Yeah, been a hectic, hectic week. Um, yeah, it was amazing, to be honest, Radley College, to uh, welcome sort of just over 40 uh, up-and-coming juniors who are just looking to transition into just, you know, good teams as well. Um, so hopefully they all took away a few things that they'd learned on the camp. But I think the big message was, I think what we've learned as well, and you, you know, doing doing your research and coaching is kind of having goals that, yes, they can be objective, but also having kind of process oriented goals. Um, so, you know, what are you going to do to reach that, that marker that you've set yourself, whether it be top 10 at a national cross or, you know, an England vest or, you know, run a PB, that's all very well, but, you know, what are you actually going to do to get it? So is it you're know, going to get nine hours sleep a night? You're going to stretch every night for 15 minutes and actually having those goals and sticking to those goals is going to get you the success you want. Um, so that was like one of the key messages we we sort of tried to tried to put onto the kids um, as well, because I think me and you both know um, at that age, that is more important than um, sort of chasing those really objective goals because they will come if you just nail the basics. Um, so, but no, it was a very, very fun few days, even myself. I think I'm just as tired as the kids are. Um, I'm looking forward to tracking their progress um, and actually building a bit of a community um, that they can kind of lean on should they need any support over the next 12, 18 months and beyond, to be honest with you. So, but yourself as well, mate, Lum is, I mean, I keep saying he's officially a doctor. I think I've said that for like the past, you know, year or so, but actually he is actually officially a doctor now. He's got that DR in front of his name. Yeah, the paper paperwork's done finally. So it's all... All done and dusted now, um, but you have announced it before, mate. But yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's nice to, you know, it's like, it's like having a, you know, when you run that PB and then it's not on para 10 for a while. So it's not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not official, official, um, but no, it's a great official, comparison. Official, so. so it's good. Yeah. Maybe, maybe at some point I'll talk about some of the coaching stuff on the pod. We have been talking about that for a while. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe message us if you would be interested in some of that. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think we get a bonus. I definitely think we get a bonus episode out with you, man, because you've done so much research in the coaching field. And what we mean by that is it's not it's not research on how to set a training program and different training principles. It's actually research on how coaches sort of, I guess, portray themselves to athletes, how they interact with athletes, isn't it? And how they kind of motivate them. So it's kind of the almost like that inner sight between coach and athlete in that relationship. Yeah, yeah. A lot of what we did was about actually kind of how you, not how you like go away from the physiology, because obviously we know it's so important. Like obviously all the threshold stuff's really important and all the research in that area is also important. But what, what we looked at was how you kind of blend some of that kind of hard objective scientific knowledge of, I don't know, what pace you need to run to hit a certain millimole with an athlete's everyday understanding of what they're doing in practice, like whether that be we're doing a steady run or like we're running to feel or like what is what does this mean when when my coach says that for example because you can't always as everyone knows particularly when it's on the start line you can't say to an athlete well yeah, yeah get around the course and make sure you're at 3.5 millimoles for the first 80 percent of the race like it's impossible so at some point we've got to find some sort of links um between what you actually tell them before the race um if you tell them anything um and, and kind of trying to hit those those markers that we know are important as well so yeah, a few few bits in there um, around that, but yeah, maybe 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 end end of the year or off season time, we'll we'll get into some of that. Yeah, in my opinion, that's it's the more important side of coaching. To be honest with you, um, you know, everyone everyone has a good understanding of training, um, especially if you you kind of been in the sport a while, and and I think you know, if you've got the experience, maybe you're a coach with 20 years experience, but it's how you kind of put that training onto an athlete, how you interact with them. Um, so kind of, and funny enough, actually bottle 
brings us home in his podcast, doesn't he? He talks about he was starting to lose belief in himself and transitioning to Steve Cram. It was amazing. Cram actually kind of believed in him and and saw the kind of, I guess, the ability Bottle has um, and the talent. So and I think that kind of just changed Bottle's mentality and everything. It's just kind of uplifted him now. Um, and now he's running better than ever. So it's kind of a direct, direct story there as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, before we get into that episode, then let's get into some results, mate. Because we obviously had a uh, road release at the weekend. Oh yeah, Jesus, man. Yeah, time is. Yeah, God, it feels like a while ago now. But uh, big day, big day out for for Leeds. Obviously, they dominate. Um, I guess it was kind of to be expected. Um, Bristol and West with a. Uh, they hate me for saying it, but maybe a surprising silver. But I think it goes to show when it comes to the 12 stage, I think their whole, all of their long legs were about 10 seconds apart. And that is just consistency gets you up there. Um, so they had a great day out, but I guess the big story from, from the road relays was the Highgate and Cambridge and Coleridge fiasco. Um, obviously they do a mass start late on um, Cambridge, Tommy Bridger coming through for that last leg. Um, and, and the mass start gets set off. So, Bridget has to kind of weave himself through a few of those slower runners um, and what impact that had because, yeah, I think he closed a pretty large gap, 40 seconds or so um, on Highgate. and But then in the end, obviously Highgate come away on that sprint finish and we're looking at fine margins here. So, um, But I've spoke to a few people and a few people said, oh, it's terrible. And a few people said, look, it really wasn't that bad. But I guess it depends what side of the fence you're on. But there you go. That's you know that's our sport in a nutshell, isn't it? These things, these things happen. Yeah, of course. They shouldn't happen, over, but they do. Yeah, that was that was obviously over on the men's side. Um, on the women's side, T- Thames Valley Harriers take the win. Um, so good out in there, and and that's that's probably one that's a bit of a surprise too, because obviously we we're so used to seeing all the shot um rock mm. up and, and dominate all of these events. Oh mate, it's really good to see a kind of different team get that get that victory um and they had a huge day out i think all their women like really really stepped up as well and i think we mentioned bristol and west on the men's side just being consistent Thames valley were the same got off to a great start and just literally pretty much stayed there all race mm. um so a big day out for them and i think as well like the 12 stage just shows like it's again like i've been having a few conversations with a lot of people around the 12 stage and everyone is very supportive of the event. Everyone loves the event. Um, but I think everyone sees the potential in it. And I think a lot of our, a lot of people, including ourselves, you look at the event and you go, it's good, but it could be something special. It could be something really good. You think about the teams who gear, gear up towards it. Um, you think about the talent that we could have on display there. Um like we know Leeds won, Sesman ran, but imagine Oldershot have a rival team where they get people like Jack Rowe, Barnico to commit to that team and have a real dust up round there and the times we could see. And again, like if the event was covered, um, even, you know, actually Callum Elson was on the camp this week, so I had some great discussions with him about it. And he's got some amazing ideas of kind of how to improve the 12 stage, like a lot of people do. Um, and it's even like, you know, you what Sutton Park is a hard course to watch, especially on those long legs. Um, it's very hard to kind of get out and support the teammates and understand, you know, where your team is, what the gaps are. And, you know, is it that difficult? We had a few... I guess, timing mats dotted around the course so you could start to see if gaps were closing, if positions were changing um, and stuff like that. Or could they make maybe the laps a bit smaller? I guess that gets a bit confusing. But again, I think the next step for the 12 stage is to potentially cover that event and just create a lot more hype going in. It kind of comes and goes quite quickly and I think it could be built up. Do you think having... Having like uh, it's a perfect uniform. time of year to add as well. Do you think having uniform distances would help? Say that like we had a oh. results list of like a number of sub fourteen five Ks, for example, as a short leg. Yeah, you yeah you say that, but like you go on their record books or or, or the the archives, the history. Yeah, true. And true. like you do have some amazing, ama- You've got it, it dates back for years. You know the people of Dave Bedford's like whip round there and something mm. silly. I know the course is change slightly over the years as well um but i think anyone in the sport knows the 
okay, if you, if you run 26, you know, sub 26 on the men's side, ran that long leg, that's a pretty serious leg. Um, if you get anywhere near low 25, you're like, that person's flying. Like, I think year, Yi run like 24.59 one year. Mm. God, that's pretty super shoes as well. <laughs> um, so like you Same do- leg as me, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. It. I was on, I was on my way out on the long stretch <laughs> and saw, saw him <laughs> Only about two miles behind the guy at that point. Oh, but... I was like, wow! Imagine I felt like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just slogging away. Yeah, that's when. Yeah, long leg in in, in old shoes used to be absolutely horrendous. I remember doing that in streak sixes. My car was wrecked. It was undulating as well, you know, all those hills, yeah. like, you know, those minimal flats and you'd like slam down those hills, um, different ball game now. But, but yeah, you talk about uniform distances. I think they pretty much are because everyone kind of knows like, true, true. you know, and the short leg is pretty much 5k um, anyway. So, and obviously it's just, it's undulating, but, but yeah, I think the next stage for it is to potentially make qualification a little bit harder as well. I'm not... I, People might not like this, but I'm not sure we need so many teams there. Um, yeah. Because in my opinion, that whole mass start fiasco, I'm like, why is there even a mass start? Like, and this is our, it, you know, I guess this is our argument all the time. Like, it's a national event. Um, the regionals is kind of where you have those. Yeah, that's something. The, the, the regional event teams. is there for a reason, isn't it? To, to allow that. Think, what yeah. is it? 12 qualify from each region? No, 25. So, well, 25 from the Southerns, um, at least. Wow. And it might be, you know, 15 or 20 from the Midlands and Northerns. I can't quite remember. But, um, but yeah, and you're just like... And the thing is as well, I think when you get to national sometimes, the good teams get stronger, but the weaker teams get weaker. Because I know from my experience and, and sort of smaller clubs, they go, oh, God, it's a little bit further to travel. Can't be fucked yeah. with that one. You know, whereas the Southerns are like, oh, we'll be up there a little bit more. Um, it's not too far away. We'll get it done. Um, and, it, you know, I can't speak for the Northern and Midland teams, but it's probably similar. Whereas the big teams, you know, they put out like almost a B team in the regional rounds and then bring in all the big yeah. guns for the nationals. Um, but I think they could probably limit that event to 20 teams. Yeah, Kinda I like think I'd agree with that. Premier League format. Should have patches as well on the vest. National road relays. Exactly. So, so that was the road relays. Uh, what else is going down at the moment? Aussie national champs are going down at the moment. So actually recording at men's 1500 final hasn't been run yet, but Ollie Hoare, McSwain and Cam Myers um, going head to head. I'm quite looking forward to it. Yeah. And Ollie Hoare's obviously brought in the blue hair. Um, who, who knows if he's going to run like Sonic, you know, I'd imagine. Blue hair and sunglasses. That's his, that's his <laughs> aim. So, um, interesting, interesting to see. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to see him back though, isn't it? It is, it is. And and actually, on um, on the kind of Oli Hoare and, and the OAC group, um, I was listening to their latest Coffee Club podcast. So check it out if, you, if, if you're a fan of running podcasts and they were talking about Joe Klecker. Joe Klecker's got a bit of an injury at the moment and um, how he's cross training and he's taken cross training to like another level. So he's not just on the elliptical and Zwift and all that kind of stuff. He's actually doing anaerobic workouts. So apparently you, you kind of, from what uh, Morgan McDonald was saying, you kind of restrict your blood flow so that basically you're like, you can walk on a treadmill and you'll be like in anaerobic hell. Like you'll be in lactic hell because you're restricting your blood flow all around your body. I'm not quite sure how it works. I only listened to podcasts last night. So like I say, I need to go read up on, on the subject, but I thought, God, that really is uh cross training to a new level, isn't it? You're not just getting the aerobic endurance. You're not just kind of like trying to get your heart rate up on a bike or an elliptical and, and finding it quite difficult. Runners typically find that quite difficult to do. Um, but yeah, you're actually restricting your blood flow. So, you know, his heart rate will go from 150 to like 170, 180 and his lactic will be able to go up as well. So you can still train that system. I thought, God, those guys are just ahead of the game. I'm sure many elites have stumbled across that already, but yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, mate, Jake Smith would be all over that, wouldn't he? That guy, that guy cross trains like an absolute madman. So, uh... well, it's probably, ah, this, this, this is probably just me just thinking right now, but like, if you did struggle to kind of produce lactic, like some endurance runners, like it might be a good thing to 
to do. I don't know. I need to go read the papers. They did mention a few, you know, you can read up on it in the papers and mm. stuff. I literally, I'm just regurgitating what they said on the podcast, to be honest. So it was, it was not in depth or anything like that. But I thought. Yeah, don't worry, guys. Nothing, no danger of anything scientific coming out of this podcast. <laughs> so. Talking of papers, though, mate, we've had a few people, shout out Tom Wood, Oxford student, and uh, and a few others as well, send in uh, who found, found the paper that we were talking about last week, the doping paper. Oh yeah, I admit I've not been looking at the inbox, so I'll have to I'll have to go back. Is it Credible Journal? Do you know? Did you ask the Oxford boys? I'm sure they'll know. Oh, it is very much credible. Yeah. Okay. Very much credible, and it, it's quite scary because yeah, it came out officially as forty three point six percent admitted to doping, and this was I think it was twenty eleven. Debut. debut, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Yeah, 2011 Deggy World Champs. And then it was, uh, it was, there was a Pan Am American Games as well. And I was like, Jesus, who was there in Deggy? Jaylan. Jaylan beat Farrah that day. <laughs> yeah, but clean as a whistle at the top. So <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because you think as well, like, let's put it this way if it was me, I wouldn't be admitting in any anon- anonymous survey. Well, well, this is what, that's what I mean. Like. That's that's forty three percent who've admitted to it because they are trusting that the survey is anonymous. Like mm. if 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 that was me and my livelihood, there's mm. no way I'd be admitting on anything. If I okay. if obviously I'd gone to the trouble of doing it in the first place, I'm not saying I would, but yeah, it. So it's yeah. Then there it could be scary. more as well. Also, well, Max I, Davis. I think at least double. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, just also Max Davis uh, sent sent us an article in as well, so I shout him out. Um, he stumbled across it for a bit of uni research himself. So, uh, yeah, that's good. But also a little bit more news, mate, before we get into bottle, we'll, we'll promise you we'll get moving now. But the Olympic Olympic prize money that got announced by War Athletics just offering $50,000 up to up to that gold medalist. Um, it's, it's been well received. I think people in other sports have gone, oh, you know, that's unfair. You're basically making our sport look crap. Um. Well, isn't that kind of what happens in the world? Like w- athletics looks bad if you compare it to football or cycling or these other yeah, sports. Yeah, I'm not like, being funny. Like, I, I know we are don't slightly, deserve fifty thousand pounds. They yeah. like. <laughs> I know we are slightly biased, but I'm not like track and field is the the Biggest heart sport of the, of the games. Yeah, like that, and I, I think you ask a lot of people because I. I, I I'm trying to think now. I'm, I'm going to make a really stupid statement, but even like I'm trying, I'm trying to get another of another sport where the Olympics is actually the pinnacle. There's not many. No, it's, I, I think swimming and and yeah, uh, swimming, yeah. And then to be fair, like I think but even uh, cycling, like I wouldn't say it is. No, I think track track triathlon. Cycling, yeah, no, but, cycling is not. That's, I guess track cycling. Yeah. Maybe we don't we don't know too much, but there's a few you know triathlon, swimming, and and stuff like that. But yeah, when we're com- actually talking big sports, um, global global big money sports, it's not. And I I looked at it and thought it's not enough. To be honest, I saw fifty k and I was like fifty k dollars. That's pathetic for an Olympic champion. Yeah, um, I almost think that the issue, and I think this is what Barnsley was alluding to on Twitter because he kind of responded to it. The issue is that the the growth of the sport is not being limited by Olympic gold medalists getting more money because they earn so much through endorsements after winning. Yeah. It's almost like that money would be better if you had like, I don't know, more of a bonus for just anyone who qualifies. Because you get people qualifying who don't have shoe contracts, for example. And I, that money would be obviously you can't give everyone money. Well, I don't know, maybe you could, but it's yeah. I don't mean the issue is our Olympic gold medalists not having enough funding. Mm-hmm. No, no, I hear what you're saying. Getting those, getting those athletes who are who are making that team a little bit of funding and and support, but. Yeah, the rich get richer, don't they? But I think it is a good yeah. stepping stepping stone. Um, to be honest, yeah, it's never a bad thing, thing, is it? Right. So yeah, so mate, should we should we get into this bottle red episode? Obviously, coached by Steve Cram, he's fresh off a one forty six win out in South Africa. That was actually a few weeks ago now. Um, and yeah, he's looking good ahead of this year one forty four seven five eight hundred meter man. And uh, so, if you haven't heard of him, you will now. A 
Okay, first off, Alex, just welcome to the podcast. Um, you're fresh off a, a camp and a, and a 146 season opener. How are you feeling? Thank you for having me, boys. Um, no, yeah, um, I'm feeling really good. Um, in terms of camp stuff, it's been great. Um, obviously, this year has been like the first time I've like quote unquote turned pro, if you will. So, like, I've had the opportunity to take some time off work and then like I've managed to go to camps kind of like back to back with some little stops in between. And that's kind of like been a new dynamic for me to be able to go on so many. Um, and they've seemed to have like paid off quite a bit so far. Like I'm very fit, I'm strong. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I'm in a good place and like sort of like healthy and like mentally just like happy at the moment. So it's uh, it's quite, it's took a time getting adjusted to um, like, you know, having a lot of free time, but it's kind of like what you're doing in that free time has been quite, um, quite tough at first but I've found like now with like more training and like some other stuff it's been quite it's quite productive especially like through the first early parts of the season so far anyway it's been very productive mate 146.1 out in South Africa did did you think you'd open your season that early like that's you know in March to be running 146.1 is pretty pretty decent yeah, yeah so um I think the, the plan was so we looked at a few camps and that January that camp that second camp wasn't even like a thing so basically, the January camp was first one I've done in a while. That was a we was like, yeah, we'll do that. And then I'd come back. I was like, then the last week, and I was like, oh, because basically I'm going out again to Denver uh, the 25th of this month. So that was the that's the next camp planned in from last year. Do January, then this next one like uh, April May time. That's the two camps. I'd come back and I was like, oh, I mean, I've got loads of time in between. I could just crack out on them on my own if you want. And I said it as a joke, and he was like, Steve ran with it. He was like, oh, yeah, actually, do it. If you want to do it, actually, we'll do that. And I was like, oh. but yeah, no, so we'll do it. And then um, coincided, there was a few races there. There was like the week before, there was a pace race in Poch. Uh, mm. Same thing. So the, uh, I don't know if anybody knows for the views or whatnot. It's the, They have three races, like uh, Grand Prix they have in South Africa. Um, and they have one in, I think, Poch, Pretoria, and then Johannesburg. And they call them Grand Prix 1, 2, and 3. So there's been some really fast times pumping out of them. If for people that don't know, like there's been some 213, 14 Ks by the Algerians, some 113, 14, 600s, some 143s for the 800s. So then I went to Johannesburg just almost with like, I don't know how it'll go, but it'll just give it a crack. Um, just because it's a bit lawless in terms of racing. They had 15 lads in it, no pacemaker, hmm. and everybody wants to try break 148, but likes to run 50 seconds through the bell. That's how they do it. <laughs> So it's a bit of a one to, hard to want to navigate, but the aim was to try and get a quicker season open than I've done before. So anything under 147, didn't think I'd go that far under because we've not really done a lot of like race prep. It was just more finish the camp, see where we're at. So but yeah, really happy with like a low 146. And I was like, well, actually, maybe if there's a few less people in the race, might have dipped under 146. But, you know, I can't complain at all. Um, in a phase that we're at, I think that was pretty productive and pretty successful. And the dub, and you got the win. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the win was a nice bonus. Uh, didn't, didn't. To be fair, I kind of just want to try win races anyway. So I think mm. that was like the aim, but it wasn't going to be at the sacrifice of uh, running like fifty through the bell. Like I, I had a strict sort of thing. I wanted to run like fifty-two and a half ish because that's where I'm at, at the moment. I'm not going to set off going fifty-one flat because just not been doing that sort of speed and turnover. So I just done a lot of strength work and fifteen five k stuff. So I'm thinking. Got the strength there. The second lap will take care of itself. Just need to make sure I'm out of trouble in the first lap and not get carried away. Because if you get sucked into that 50-second lap, you kind of like, the second lap's a bit of a write-off, really. Mm. Uh, even when I'm in peak fitness, I wouldn't want to be looking to do that anyway. So I just thought I need to, you know, definitely not do that. And, you know, I stuck to my guns. And in the end, like, you know, everyone was popping down the home straight. So it's quite nice to navigate through that. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about the camp itself then, because obviously you mentioned you've been on a few already. What's um what's South Africa like? Because it seems like a lot of Brits are heading heading there all the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's great. Uh, I don't know how to. I mean, for obviously like comparisons, I'd say. Um, obviously by the the altitude being a really lovely sort of like one four one five. Um, so yeah, I think from my experience, it's pretty optimum to be able to, you know, get some good aerobic work out there without sacrificing the quality on the altitude. I think if you push up to 2000, which a lot of people like to train at, you kind of have to reduce that intensity or that intensity gets quite hard um, just from personal experience. So I think that 1.5 is actually quite nice to be able to get the quality in, the speed in. And obviously the weather's great. Um, but bar that sort of like 
front of like, you know, um, the weather and whatnot. It's just like a really good sort of like universe, university town. So it's got mm. almost like a Loughborough, just if like it's comparable or like a Leeds mm. and Headingley, um, like really small university town, few coffee shops, which athletes love, um, nice food. Obviously the price for everything is super cheap compared to the UK and they've just got all the facilities. So they've got really good grass tracks, gym, uh, loads of physios and mm. uh, at, like your fingertips if you want to go down any of them. Uh, the track's really close and it's just all compact together. So you basically, once you're there, you don't have to do anything. Um, the only maybe trouble you might have is like if you wanted to do, you went on your own like I did and you were trying to do long runs and you wanted to drive out, you might need to rent a car on your own. But other than that, it's like, you know, pretty, pretty all enclosed. And I think that's what is the most appealing factor. It's that time of year. It's got the nice weather, the altitudes there. And like, you know, I think as well now, probably what's making it more appealing is like there's a, quite a lot of Brits there. So maybe mm -hmm. like people are more willing to go on their own because they're happy to see a few familiar faces. So, I mean... So I can only speak just because from experience and other people have different ones, but from mine, I think it just kind of like strikes that really nice balance of almost feeling like a home away from home. Like it's not mm. too dissimilar once you're in Poch. Mm. Yeah, it certainly looks like the vibe going down there from what we've from what we've seen at home. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, you know, you're a Commonwealth Youth Games champion over 827 teams, somewhere, something like that. World Junior finalist a year later. You mentioned obviously going pro, within the last 12 months did you think you would go pro much sooner like how was that transition obviously you had covid to negotiate as well how was that transition from where you were as a 147 junior to to kind of where you are now or the last 12 months i think speaking if i was speaking from back then naivety well maybe not naivety but i'd have thought like back then i'd have been like i'm surely gonna hit something and turn pro when i'm 18 19 mm. 1920 um and as most athletes will probably like be able to like agree with that. It doesn't always happen the same way you think. And so I've come off like, you know, a really nice uh, Commonwealth youth win gone to worlds the next year. We've unfortunately the final was a bit scrappy. I've fallen over type of thing. So I've not finished as high up, but like that's out of my hands. So I'm thinking that's fine. And then I've just not performed for the next three years. Uh, obviously that's coincided with maybe going to uni and a few other changes. And it's just not quite clicked. And I think as a youngster back then, like trying to get your head around why things aren't clicking is almost like it's quite detrimental. So like mm. you you just think it should be working. Like I'm on the right trajectory. I'm training well. Why isn't it working? And that whole sort of like second guessing and changing stuff, like almost like then pushes you further down the other way. So, yeah, I think I would, in my head, I probably back then I was thinking I'm 2021, I'm going to turn pro like I'm, well, not going to, but I'm thinking I've got a good chance. I like think I'm in 145 when I'm 20, 21, maybe then looking at 144. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so that was a bit of a wake-up call, I think, back then. Um, but then I just kind of got my head around it and thought, you know what? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But I enjoy racing and training. So I left university, finished, and then I just got a job at the local coffee, coffee shop because I really enjoy I enjoy coffee. I like making it, uh, you know, just easy as. And it's bottom of the road. And I thought I can give myself two years at this. You know, I work part time, 30, 40 hours a week, depending. Obviously, it's nearly full time, but as a coffee shop, it's not really like, you know. Um, <laughs> and then I'll train and just see what happens. And then last year, I trained with coffee, with working part time and just, just seemed to like make the jump again. Um, definitely not down to just working and training it's definitely like good planning from steve like my mm -hmm. new coach at the time um really smart and how he's done stuff and he's obviously got me into a position where i've managed to get quite fit quite quickly and um, got me out of ruts but it wasn't even smooth sailing when we first went across there either because the first couple of months i got a stress fracture when i moved to coaches so that set you back again and then so yeah it's, it's been messy but i would have thought probably a little bit sooner yeah, let's um let's chat about Steve Cram then. Like, how did how did that all come about um in the first place? Yeah, so that's um yeah, that's an interesting topic actually because so I was coming, I think it was twenty twenty one end of so September time, and um basically I've just again I've had sign sort of like a uh, them couple of years like from the world in twenty eighteen to like up until that point I've had a like I've improved like a tenth of a second each time so I'm still move in the right direction but realistically like you know, it's, it doesn't look like it so if you zoom in it's like it's not really anywhere so it's almost like a plateau 
basically I just got to the point where like I thought in 2021 at the end I hadn't made a the Europeans uh, under 23s I think it was and I was like I just want to give something a different change I maybe want to add some new stuff into training give some sort of tra change and I had a conversation with my coach at the time Hendo great guy um you know great coach for the up until this point um And basically, I just was like, oh, I think I want to change a few things. Maybe want to try some new avenues. And so we had a sit down conversation about it. Um, it was fine, went well. Uh, and then I basically spoke to um, Laura Waitman, who was coached by Steve at the time. And I was just like, do you reckon I could maybe just have a little chat just to see if he thinks there's anything I can add into my training that um, would help? Because I'm at a bit of a crossroads. I kind of want to make a change, but I don't know what change I want to make. And we end up coming out of this conversation after about um, half an hour and, or an hour. And he's like, oh, I'm willing to help if you're needing a, a new change or a new setup or you're looking at that, um, then I'll I'll be willing to help you and sort of thing. And Laura was pretty surprised. She didn't realise he was going to take on another athlete or anything. But so I went away from the conversation feeling quite like positive about it. And then I sat down with Hendo and told him, I'm, like, I'm thinking about making a change, thinking about moving across uh, to a different coach. Um you know, thankful for everything so far, made the change um, because it was something I thought I just can't turn down. Like, mm -hmm. as in, it's just, you know, I don't think I'd get the opportunity twice. My dad said, I was speaking to him, he's like, look, like, he's offered to help you out here. I think if you say no now or don't say no now, you don't you don't turn around in six months time and ask again. Like, that's just, you know, how it goes. Like, it's either you accept the opportunity or not. So I was like, all right, take it. And yeah, I took it and, it's, and he was a great guy. Um, you know, he understood like where I was coming from. terms like my weaknesses and my strengths and um training is brutal mate it's absolutely <laughs> well hard um so uh it was a big change in terms of training like in terms not even in terms of volume just that mm. sort of like uh the way he trains uh just completely different uh changing the mindset i think helped um and i think that sort of uh conversation initially was just like super like calm and it was, he was like saw the potential and i thought that's quite good because you start to lose that sort of like At, for me especially at this point I was starting to lose that sort of like oh, am I actually gonna like make anything of this you know you even though a couple of years go bad you generally still think nah I will I'll get something out of it but I was starting mm -hmm. to almost lose that open myself like thinking fucking hell like I might not get there you know and then when you get someone else like that actually you know give that sort of like confidence in you again I was a bit like you know what actually I'll give this a proper go again and then kind of like the rest is history in terms of that we like We've hit off great. He's a great coach, great guy. See him like most of the time. Uh, and yeah, training's been going like, especially this year, like really well. Talk about those those changes. You mentioned, you know, the volume maybe near enough the same, but yeah, between what you were doing to to what you're doing now, what what were the kind of biggest things that you were like, well, this is this is different? I think um, so the biggest thing difference see difference at first is definitely like a lot of like Uh, so I probably averaged the volumes, probably not really changed too much. So like I'm working with now probably about 60s ish. So not too outlandish, but like maybe on, if you're a sprint 800 meter runner, maybe a bit high, uh, mm -hmm. depending on how you got it. But basically a lot of the training changed from like, like long recovery, like fairly long recovery speed work to like really like endurance work. So I was doing a lot of thresholds, a lot of steady runs. Um, so like a, a lot of standard weeks might look like, I'd maybe do like a, a steady run on a Monday, do track on Tuesday, then back with a steady run on Wednesday, only have one easy run of the week sort of thing. Um, so a lot of like base building, a lot of just like aerobic stuff, working on like different zones. And I'd never really like done anything threshold. It was either tempo or track work that's quick, mm -hmm. which does work as well. But for me, it was like your endurance just isn't there. Like you've got no endurance realistically. And an 800 meters, you know, against popular belief at the moment is still an endurance event you need to be strong and i just wasn't so we just hammered that sort of like base building and endurance building and it you know it took a year to to go in um don't get me wrong like the first year i was with him i only ran 147 threes which is a second down on my pb uh but i got that gear of consistency so there's a lot of base building a lot of thresholds a lot of like fartlex we do like a long fartlex all the time which mm. is quite good they last like nearly like an hour It's, it's kind of good but like they're just long so many reps um and it was just a lot more like endurance focused and he was like look like your speed's not going to go we'll touch bases on it but you don't we don't need to be doing like you know some big recovery 250s for you like you're quick enough but also you don't he was trying to get my head around it but 
sounds stupid. You don't need to run, be able to run like realistically, get used to running 22, 23s. Like mm. all you need to be able to run is four 26s. That's it. So you need to be strong enough just to run consistently four times. So he said, we can train below pace for sure, but I'm saying, but you don't need to do like, I don't know, like four 250s off like 10 minutes flat out because realistically that's quite a way off what an 800 meter is going to be. You're not 10 minutes, could be too long sort of thing. We need to get that sort of average pace down. So it was a lot of focus on that. So it's kind of like you do need speed, but it's like at what point do you need it? It's not like flat out like, oh, I need to run 22s for reps because, you know, realistically, I know it's great to run them and I feel good doing them. It's But it's kind of like I'm never going to run a 22 in an 800. And if I am, mm. there's something seriously wrong. So we've come at it from more of a 15, 800 meter perspective instead of potentially like a four, eight perspective, if you're going to summarize it, which I think mm. has been a good change. I actually really enjoy it. I didn't think I ever would, to be honest. And, and what do you think the potential impact that has on maybe like your ability over the 1500, for example? Um, I think, I think I could run a good 15 like now. I think I'd be in really good shape to run one. I think last year I would have gone I would have liked to have gone a lot further under, like, well, I didn't go under 340, but I'd have liked to go quite far under. I think this year is definitely a good chance to do that. Um, but you got to give the event respect. Obviously, like, I'm not very good at racing 1,500 metres. I don't do enough of them. Um, and to run a good one, I would argue, from my, from my perspective, I'd probably need to run, like, three or four of them to then maybe utilise the sort of strength and the ability I've gained. Um, I couldn't just like, oh, because I'm super fit and I'm fast. I could just go knock out like 335. It doesn't work like that. You've got to, you know, know the event, got to know how to race the event. You know, I, I have a tendency on the third lap, as probably most people do, kind of switch off a little bit. And that third lap's vital. You need that cup seconds and stuff. So um, I think it's transferred to a good in an ideal world. Like I, I'd like to run. I mean, I'd like to run like 335 this year for 1500. And I think mm. that's doable. Um, obviously, there's loads of lads who run like 330s and stuff like that but i think that would be good for me but it would probably take a couple races mm. and what do you love about the 800 most then? um well, i don't know you know uh i actually more recently i like its competitiveness at the moment um mm. i like i like the fact that you could probably run a championship say british champs final probably five times ten times and you probably get a different outcome I'd say mm. most times. Uh, maybe you get the few outliers that'll probably do the same each time. But especially in the men's at the moment, I'd say, you know, how like unpredictable it can be. It's definitely down to positioning as well, not just someone out and out just being better, which is great mm. because, you know, you can afford to be maybe like a 145 mid guy who's like consistently and that's really good times could probably be a 143.8 guy on the day at a championship just because of how they position themselves on coming off the last bend. So I quite like that sort of like, you know, it's not just on paper because a lot of them races, maybe when you get further up in distance, a uh, 15 is pretty, a bit of a toss up as well. But maybe when you go a bit further, you can kind of be like, well, these guys have got the big PBs. There's a mm. big separation here. You're not really going to have someone come out of the woodworks and do them in a like slow race. But with an eight, it's always kind of fast. So you kind of that positioning, that sort of unpredictability, I think is really quite good. Mm. Yeah, let, let's chat about kind of that unpredictable nature then and British champs because obviously the the heats, as you found out last year, is super, super tough. Yeah. How do you ensure that How do you ensure that this year you, you make sure you're, you're in that final? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, actually. Yeah, so that last year was the first time I'd not made a final in the British champs. So I was mm. actually, that was like a new thing because I'd been like so fortunate. Well, not fortunate, I'd worked hard for every other time and that was last year, first time I was like, there's a bit of a kick in the teeth, but yeah, I mean, I think all you can do is prepare your own way, see what heats you get. Um, and to, to make sure I'm going to be in that final, I guess, kind of like, I've just got to stick to my own race. I think you get lured into a false sense of kind of like running somebody else's race if you're not as confident in your own ability sometimes. And the problem with that is generally you run someone else's race, they're going to do, probably do you in it. Um, so I think my best chances of like making the final are just sticking to my what's going to work well for me. I've got a lot stronger this last couple of years. So making sure that the first lap, if it is going to be too slow, I mean, I'm strong enough to be able to get to the front if I need to. Whereas I wouldn't have thought twice about doing that before. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's like being race aware and quite astute um, because there's going to be, the heat's going to be really hard. You're going to have like two or three guys in each heat that are all probably could get the standard at least maybe one of them for the Olympics. So um, I think, you know, being aware of that and then just kind of like giving people the respect they deserve 
obviously, because it, there's some incredible athletes we've got, but also not at sacrificing your own race. And I think the confidence from running well last year and like how I've started this year will definitely help me. I think I was a little bit sort of hesitant going into last year because I'd come off a 147 years and I was still sort of building up. I'd, I'd run a big PB going into the race, uh, but then the week after I'd raced in Watford, hadn't really raced very well. The race itself was a bit of a messy one, but kind of finished like I think eighth or something or seventh in a pretty close blanket finish field, 148 after running 145 the week before. So I was a bit like up and down. So I think in my own head personally, maybe I wasn't quite uh, as confident as I could have been. Um, and maybe I didn't quite take the race to certain people when like, and kind of like let the race happen around me and just kind of like let it unfold instead of actually taking charge. So I think maybe attacking it more this year and being, you know, confident in my own ability while respecting others, I think will be quite important. It was trickier, you know, you're in the same heat as what Patson and Bergen and like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a quite a hard heat actually. Yeah. Um, by the one in Watford, like I was thinking, I was like, I was looking at my season. I was like, by the Watford race, it's a bit of a, like a kind of rubbish anomaly. I think, um, I was like, you know what? I'm not lost. I've, I've not come out of the top three all year. So I've got to take some you know, credit in that. And the only two lads to have beat me uh, all year generally were like Ben and Max and the London mm. Diamond again and the Heat. So mm. I was like, you know what? It wasn't a bad two people to be beaten by because them two ended up going to world champs. Mm. They've, they've run really well all year. And obviously they finished, you know, Ben's was top 10 in the world, I think probably on you know rankings yeah max a top 10 top in the uk 143.5 or eight or something so you know super respectable guys so i think you know i can't you know beat myself too much up about it but i would have liked to give myself probably more of a fighting chance Mm. and then a big and then a big breakthrough man 144 seven this year so you know you bounce back from that how what was it like kind of smashing that barrier getting that kind of monkey off your chest if you like dipping below that 145 yeah for sure like that was um really good i mean i don't know if we um I don't, I don't know if we expected to go that quick or like didn't expect it i was kind of going into the race thinking you know i've got one last race of the season which decides how many more races i do basically um and which races i can do and it was kind of like well british champs didn't go very well the race before british champs was a bit like iffy um throw the kit you just got to throw the kitchen sink at it. you don't really get these opportunities too often especially like a london diamond league-esque race mm. Um, obviously it's a British field set up, but you don't get them races often, especially in the crowds or anything. So I think it was massively important just to take that opportunity and, like, and enjoy it because, you know, you don't know if you do that again. They've not got an 800 metres at London Diamond League this year. So, yeah, I know. So, like, they don't have an 800 this year. So, like, that won't come around again for at least another year. So, like, a British-only field, it's the quickest one, I think, um, was ever made for, for a British-only mm-hmm. race. Um, so I think really good. I mean, to get that off my like back was massive it took a lot of pressure off it just kind of like gave me more confidence going into training the training i did the week later from london Iron league was the best training i'd done all year but i think it just because i had that sort of more confidence like you know actually i am able to compete with these guys um so yeah no it was massive and you know it ended up almost changing my sort of life for the next couple of years mm-hmm. i mean i signed a contract based off that um and based off the prospect of the next couple of years um and it's allowed me to you know go on these camps this year which has contributed to some really good fitness and a good season opener hopefully you know it kind of like predicts a good season to come so without that sort of like opportunity and race i think it's you know it makes uh, a lot of this other extra stuff happen now like a knock-on effect um so yeah super grateful for that one yeah one thing we wanted to ask you as well is about kind of the training group you got going on now is this still just just you and steve or or are you kind of starting to build something so um no groups um uh no groups but um because i don't think he's like we're going to formulate a group or anything um but we do there is one other guy so mm-hmm. um I don't, you know james young we do <laughs> you know james young? yeah exactly james young great guy uh and so he joined i think probably a year ago now maybe a bit over a year ago um and so he joined the group um and he's recently moved to leeds as of like maybe i don't know how many months ago now maybe six six or eight months ago um, and we train together maybe because he does like 15s mm. upwards, a few eights. I do like eight fifteen, probably won't do a five, but maybe on the road. Um, so there's like that niche where we can join together. So tomorrow we'll do fart leg together. Uh, that'd be that'd be sweet. And then like Tuesdays, we might do like 15, 3K session together. Thursdays, we do our own thing. But it's always nice because we warm at the same time. Um, and it's just like quite a nice little environment. 
Um, in terms of the team, I mean, the group's obviously kind of that. And obviously, Steve also coaches a marathon runner called Mary. Um, mm. So as terms of a team, it's just like them two, us two as an athlete. But in terms of like the more like um, the team, like further from that would be like Laura helps all the time. So Laura Waitman helps all the time. And we've got two of the gym staff, like my um, helps me like and James all the time and Dane and stuff. So that's great in terms of that secondary outlet. And then Steve comes down basically like, I'd argue like on average, maybe like once every two weeks or maybe once a week, to be fair. It's probably more than most people think, but he's on the phone all the time. So, and obviously with Laura here, always, it's like, you've always mm. got a coach. Mm. So yeah, in terms of that team environment, there's only like two of us, but like it works quite well because I actually really enjoy training on my own. But then there is an, it is a nice bit of respite when you are able to like, you know, exchange reps on like a longer session, kind of halves. I was going to say, that is good, man. It sounds like, you know, it's good that you and James um, could trade together. Something's forming there. Um, I think people have got to watch out for you two uh, going forward. But uh, how have you kind of coped with, because presume, you know, when you're at uni and you're under Hendo, Hendo is probably there for every single session. I know you yeah, say so, you're running on your own, but how? what's it like not having Steve there but still executing the workout set? Yeah, I think more so last year, especially because I'd finished work at like most of the time if I was doing the session, I'd finish work at like three, sit down mm. for an hour and then start my session at four, start jogging. So like and I would just be on my own some most of the time um, just because like when finishing work doesn't always line up with people coming across. Um, at first it was a bit to get used to, but I think – what change not just the training change with when i moved coached i think my mindset changed because i thought if i'm actually going to give this a proper crack of like i'm making a change well then you've got to honor the change and got to invest in it so like the sacrifice of training on your own is something i've chosen to do i knew that i was going to have to do that so it's not something i i, I can moan about mm -hmm. so i was more of the thing like well what's the annoying thing here at the moment oh i'm training on my own yeah but you've chosen to train on your own like you've chosen to go find a, a new coach and uh, you know you're wanting to be willing to accept this new training with open arms and now you complain about it you can't do that so it's just i've, I've just had to like change the mindset and be like well i have to work hard on my own because that's the, how i've chosen to do it you know it's only on me like i'm the one that's like reached out and wanted to make a change and i knew what i was getting myself into some days don't get me wrong it's rubbish obviously you turn up to the track it's piss wet through and it might you might just happen to be on your own but i think just in my head what makes i think you know what if i'm training with someone or you know someone jumps in in this session i'd like to think i'd be able to get that a little bit more out so i'm happy to in my head to be like oh it might be a bit harder now but you know in a race day or like a training day with a few of the lads i'll get that extra bit out so if i can get as much as i can out now then hopefully you know it kind of like pushes me when i'm in a group with somebody so I just kind of think it gives me that extra bit. I will try to trip myself and see mm -hmm. it kind of gives you the extra bit. But yeah, for sure. Some days are hard on your own, especially like today I've got, I'll do like two threshold type of stuff and like, that's fine. But like, it's going to be a little bit, it's just annoying to get out of the house on your own twice. Do like hard efforts. Um, are you, are you double workout, double workout day. Well, it's not, it's, no, it's not even, well, it's not even, oh, I've got, I had a workout yesterday. I've got a workout tomorrow. These are just runs, but they're just hard. Uh, so, oh, so just two you just got two steady runs or two tempo runs to knock out yeah that's uh, I, did, I did it last week probably a little bit quicker than i would normally do but i did last week just around the streets here and I, it was like an mm. average i just hit five five mile like five fifteens and then either side of two sessions which just actually came off all right but sunday i was absolutely cooked mate i was absolutely ruined but this, yeah, this, i enjoy this. it Wait, that's, does Crammy set any paces or is he just, you know, still sticking his old school guns and just going, you know, hard, steady? Easy? Yeah, it's funny because if you ask him and ch chat about it, he's like, well, we used to do it and, you know, just get out the door with a few of the lads and someone would fancy it that week. And, you know, someone would start picking up the pace and you see what happens, see if, who's, who's got it at the end. And you, you, we, do, we know the loop's about four or five miles. So just nail it and just, you know, who's got it towards the end and people just keep picking up, picking up. So he, he doesn't always set paces like, for James, sometimes he'll set a few paces. And for me, sometimes he'll set a few paces. But then it'll either just be like, you know, five steady, just crack it out. You know what that is. You don't mess around. Or it's like, e, like you know, five as feel. So if you feel like you can go steady that day, go for it. If you don't feel like it, you feel actually a bit tired. That's the day where you, you know, you make that decision yourself and go easier. So you get a quite a lot of like um, self input if you want. But yeah, if I did half the stuff he used to just knock it out. It'd be, it'd be mental. Some of the stuff is crazy. <laughs> I always joke and be like, well, you know, 
it's different knowing it back in the day because you boys, you know, you say you run that minute per mile, but you had the cassette <laughs> watch, didn't you, mate? You didn't even know where the times were. It's like you just time it on a cassette. You might have even done three miles saying you've done four and a half. You know what I mean? You know, we don't actually know. Come on. Yeah, that's a that's a debate Matt and I have all the time when people start talking about their training from uh, back in the day, don't we? So yeah, anyway, um, crazy. I was like, Casio, mate, it's a young time. You don't, you don't know the GPS. You don't yeah. know that five miles, mate. Was all these marathon runners? They say, "Oh yeah, I used to 120 mile a week, average about five minute pace for everything." It's like, okay, it's like, yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So I said the same thing. I was like, "Well, we have the, we might have the nice shoes, mate, but like you, you had the dodgy stopwatch. So I'm not really sure unless it was on a track." <laughs> <laughs> so i have that joke all the time but has yeah, he, he did has, he, has he ever told you some of um is it at that stage yet where he's comparing sessions he executed to you oh, like has he, has he let you know of some stage, of the workouts mate that stage was from the word go he t- <laughs> i get no sympathy like on any of the stuff which is great i don't need it but like we do like some sessions and so I've done my best. I did it the other day, the other week. I did 10 threes and it was the best I'd done it in. I'd done 10 threes off 60 second hundred jog. Uh, and I'd done like four. The average was 43.07. Wow. So I'm like solid, mate. I'm like, I'm buzzing. And obviously I'm giving it big licks like usual. I'm just yapping away. Like, yeah, I'm, I've got this in it. I'm just giving it to him. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, we used to do proper jog recovery and that maybe 30, 45 seconds, mate. And I knocked it out in like 41. So I don't, you know, don't know what you're yapping about. And I just, <laughs> For fuck's sake. Yeah, just 40 40 ones, mate. I was like for 10, and we do it in like 30 45 seconds. I was just like, all right, yeah, nice one. Nice. I was like, yeah, nuts. But like, he's like, they he's got all the stuff for it, and he's like, yeah. And I was just like, they're a different breed, though. Like, he was like, you know, one of the best in the world. The difference is, yeah. like, you know, I'm I'm like to think I'm getting to a good level of running, but like, you know, he was, it's not like I'm talking to like someone, you know, that's just was good, like, obviously, really, really good. So, um and the range that he had was incredible so yeah I, I, I do believe him but it's just yeah it does definitely be like oh yeah actually it's not that quick than what i've done <laughs> so it's yeah, nice mu- place must be nice to have him in your corner though for sure um let's um let's chat about just before we finish then what what race have you got coming up yeah so um most immediately i'm gonna fly back to fly back fly t- to colorado i'm gonna stay in denver um for a couple of weeks that's i'm gonna base there i'm gonna race uh twice in america i'm gonna to go to sound running on the 11th and then i'm gonna head back um to denver and i'm gonna go back again for la grand prix on the 18th or 17th um and then fly home from there so the next two are both in la both at the same track um one's i think i, I don't know the, the levels of tours they are i'm sure la grand prix is gold uh, not sure about the sand running. I think that's maybe silver uh, or mm. bronze. I'm not sure, but it should be, hopefully be quite a nice little step up um, in terms of uh, where I've been. Because I think, you know, the one in uh, Johannesburg was a challenger, but, you know, the only thing separating them races from being challengers or like bronze and silvers is just the funding they've got for them. Because the quality of athletes some of them get out of there is ridiculous. Like mm. they're so fast. So, mm. uh, yeah, there are two immediate races. Going to try, hopefully, knock out some decent times there. Uh, mm-hmm. and then mid start of June maybe end of May try find one just trying to nail one more down one the one where I can work back from and be like yeah that's the one I'm picking for trying to run that Olympic standard really but by the sounds of that there's no there's no European champs in the diary like you're not you're not leaning towards that you don't want to you don't want to be in Rome this year Olympics oh, no, is no no yeah for sure no 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 100% yeah yeah I'll um yeah I, I want to do European champs um but um yeah, you. I can't really plan based on the fact I'm doing that or not doing that because that's just a selection. Yeah. Um. I know the selection criteria and the time I got from last year, so I'm in definitely a good running for it. And I know mm. I think a few athletes have chosen to focus on just the Olympics mm. uh, in 800 meters. I think. Um. Not sure exactly who, but um. I think there's a few that are leaning towards just wanting to do the Olympics, which might free up a spot or two. Um. But yeah, it's definitely in my mind because. For me, uh, for someone that hasn't competed at uh, a senior level or even competed at like a champs for a while, I think I mm. would, I couldn't, don't think I could like, you know, be happy being like, oh, I don't want to do European champs. I'm just want to do the Olympics. That's all I want to do. Don't make the Olympics. Could have done European champs. You end with nothing. I really do think like if I get the opportunity to run for the GB, I'll definitely take it. I, you can't, I don't think you can't not, especially for someone like mm. myself, like trying to break into that sort of like, you know, 
uh, level, I think it's it would be invaluable sort of um, you know experience. And I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do both if mm. if if you're running well enough. Um, yeah. For me, especially. I mean, maybe the others just want to focus on it because they may be looking at different things, which is completely like fair. But if I can run the times that I need to in May with these next LA competitions um, and get the nod for Europeans, yeah, I'll definitely go for sure. Love that, man. And 144.7, that Olympic standard. How many men do you reckon will hit that this year? Um, How many have done it already? Is it like four of you guys? Five, maybe? Three of us hit it. I didn't hit it. I was 500 off. So. Yeah, uh, Bergen, what, Bergen, Rowden, and mm. Patterson, and then there was me. I actually think there's probably going to be. Thing is, I think people hit the standard a lot more hit the standard, but it just depends whether people hit the standard before they need to hit it. Yeah. So I think you'll end the season with a lot of people hitting the standard because mm. I think people are run well this year because there's a lot of people lads moving well. Uh, but it depends whether they can get them races nailed down before the, I would imagine, before the uh, the selection date, mm. um, which is, I think, the you know the first week in July or something. Mm. Uh, I, but you're probably looking at like, probably looking at nearly like six or seven, maybe even eight, I'd say, probably. Probably double what's hit last year, just because people step up this year, don't they? And they're yeah. going to do that. There's a lot of 144 nines last year, 144 eights. And if they step up with the way that I think they will and like people will run consistently because I think everyone's kind of had that good bit of training this year you can just imagine them knocking that only like 0.3 of a second off they only mm. have to get it by like 100 same with me like it's 100 and then you've everyone's got it so <laughs> I think definitely the hard yeah. thing will be trials for sure so, so you go and nail that standard like next race for example obviously obviously fingers crossed for you do you then do you then go and chase more or does training change and you just go all eyes on on the trials? If I nailed it, well, I wouldn't know about the second race in sand running, but if I nailed it, say, in LA, yeah, it definitely changes. Changes, it would just, it doesn't change how I perceive maybe like Europeans and like doing my race, but it definitely changed the, the races I do. I'll definitely, mm. if I run 140, if I run the standard before... I come back from America, I'll definitely do 15s. I'll definitely do a couple 15s. Mm -hmm. uh, if I don't, then obviously they won't happen until the end of the year. Um, but I think it would change just probably how many races you do because you. I think, you know, training is vital, obviously, and you mm -hmm. can't race super quality races without having to take a little bit off training. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can get that standard early, like you kind of set to be able to, you know, uh, get that training in. It's a long year, you know, you got to be ready in August to run quick so it'll i think alleviate a lot of people not just myself if you got it early it means you could get that dip almost like sacrifice not being so sharp from i don't know three or four weeks and just get that base back in again because mm. you know, you're going to need it come august so uh yeah i think it'll just change the tra the gear training i think we'll be able to maybe have a bit more like base building and like maybe do a few 15s really but mm. you know that would be lovely if i got it on the second one out wouldn't it that would Mate, be good. it would be i mean on that How's the race shaping up? You got any idea of who's going to be in that race? I see um, Josh Glenn's doing the Oregon Oregon relays, isn't he? Yeah, I've seen a few a few names being like flitted around. Um, they'll definitely like in terms of it'll be mostly I think domestic fields for them. Yeah, so, like um, I don't think there'll be a lot of traveling across because they don't actually like funding international travel to go there that much. Mm. They prefer in house, and it's just because I'm already over there for a training camp that it works because they don't fund travel or stuff. So a lot of like European athletes generally probably wouldn't go to that. So it will mm. just probably be like more domestic athletes, but I'm probably thinking LA Grand Prix is probably going to have like most of their like top guys, if not, because I mean, there's a diamond league maybe a week before, I think is it. Other side of the world though, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So I think, but you've got to take maybe eight or so athletes, nine, 10, mm. that'll do that. Maybe two of them will be American. You might get Hopple do it. Uh, mm. So he might not be there, but I think you'll probably get like the likes of maybe like Isaiah Harris, maybe even Kyle Langford will do it to be fair. Cause mm. he's over there. Um, I think LA Grand Prix will be quick. Definitely. Mm. Uh, haven't got the feels just yet, but when no. I do, I can uh, let you know, but yeah, I've got nothing yet, but I'm thinking I probably like, they say both of them are definitely going paced at the Olympic standard. So, I mean, it'll be, uh, you know, flat out from the gun, I would imagine, but that's what it's going to be like all year, isn't it? So 26 years, mate, you got it in you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, when you break it down and say, oh, you just need to run four. Yeah, it sounds right, mate. It's, it's well. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm looking forward to the year. I'm super excited. Um, mm. 
training's going well. I'm happy to, you know, crack on. I'm just grateful for obviously what I get to do. So yeah, I can't can't complain over here. You love it, man. Yeah, good stuff, mate. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Um, and we wish you all the best for the rest of the season. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the invite. It's been great. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's my first one, so first podcast in general. So yeah. Are you get snapped up now, mate? You're gonna be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're too busy gaming, mate. I, you know, I've got to, got to fit my hours of gaming each week. What, what, what do you play? What are you into? Um, I, I recently just bought a PS5 to play a new game on it. It's called like, uh, oh, I'm going to bait myself out here. It's called Helldivers. It's just like a first person shooter. Oh, that arcade okay, shooter, mate. So like mind numb, just the same thing over again. <laughs> or FIFA, obviously. FIFA. Yeah. That's it, mate. I've like, I think, oh, oh, mate, I think I've racked up like nearly 90 hours on this game already. It's not been like <laughs> that, 90 hours is so much. So you're pro, enjoying pro not working at the coffee shop yeah. anymore? <laughs> yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's good. I mean, it's great. I'm just kind of like, I the 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 transition at first is actually pretty hard. I, I didn't, because yeah. I, I wasn't training that much. And I got injured like after London a little bit. Um, and I didn't race for ages. And I didn't, I didn't actually start training until January. So like, I had so long out from like September to Jan that I was like, a pro not training so i was doing nothing mate and i was just mm. like sat there doing nothing i was like i actually felt like a full-time dosser like it's awful it was rubbish like as in i felt Wait, you... You... so so you only started training really when you went to south africa this year yeah so the first week in south africa i ran 30 miles um because i i also came off the plane with a, a hamstring so on the plane i'd I like the tempo before uh, i had food poisoning the week before that Mm. Then, <laughs> so then I went to South Africa and then because I and then I came off the plane and I would pulled my left hamstring just in terms of like the right the top like nerves couldn't even like run without like limping at first because it was just the nerves were just weren't freeing up because of the right. journey and then it got freed up and then I ran like so I ran like 30 miles 50 miles 68 60 and then finished the camp but yeah I had a, a proper training like full week started January yeah. I'd maybe jog, doing a bit of jogging in December but yeah, nothing really. I couldn't do anything. I had my po- I had my semi membranosis hamstring um towards the end of September. I uh I pulled it quite badly. Uh, it turns out it was the bursa behind the back of the knee just wouldn't go down because she couldn't do anything. That's why I didn't race after London. Um because couldn't couldn't just couldn't accelerate without it shutting down. Um so I had to rest for ages. My God. Jeez. Anything. Well, you're doing all right, mate. So bloody oh, yeah, hell, that's a good recovery. Sense. That's yeah, thank you very much. It's all good now, touch wood. So, you know, I don't think it like got me back or anything. I just think it was like it just highlighted the fact of like when you're not running, you don't do anything. Right. Do you think, I mean, you talk about getting that stress fracture early on as well. Um, do you think kind of those initial conversations with Cram, like, and just getting on that program, was it, was it quite a quick transition? Some coaches say, like, oh, you know, we'll carry on doing what you've been doing for ages, but it was Cram like ripping up. He was like, right, we're just going to crack on, mate. We're just. Well, it was it's quite fortunate when I trained I joined I joined just after my off season. Right. So I was in off season and having the conversation in the end. So I'd finished the season and he was like, right, okay, we'll build you from the ground up. So realistically, mm-hmm. I got a stress fracture, but I had some really stressful like situations going on just in personal life. So I wasn't right. really sleeping very well and I wasn't training that much. Probably I think at the time, I think the, the biggest mileage I did when I was hitting with Cram was like forty and it was two sessions. So there wasn't anything in terms of like actually doing mm-hmm. it running i just don't think i was actually like fueling properly and resting in between them so unfortunately it coincided with moving coaches like oh he's broken new coach i was like <laughs> classic in it really but i was just oh yeah. god yeah yeah. yeah all right mate we'll we'll there we go we'll double wrap it up now because uh we digress as well so we'll leave you to it mate but thanks very much cheers thank you very much for having me boys and uh all the best i'm sure i'll see you both soon cheers buddy cheers mate Yeah, great to hear from Alex there. Um, so, like as Matt said before the episode, like you, you should know a whole lot more about him now because I think he's someone that has been he's been around on the on the circuit in the he was a success, successful junior, um, some good results, but probably someone who we don't see too much of in terms of kind of learning about his training um, or anything like that. He obviously mentioned to us first podcast he's done. Um, so yeah, great to have him on, wasn't it? Was and I think the the exciting thing about Botto is he's obviously really really talented, but not to say Hend- Henderson, uh, Andy Henderson wasn't a good coach for him. But when if you're looking at someone, you go, "Blimey!" If I Steve Cram in their corner, 
they got Laura Waitman in their corner, you know, and then they've got both of those kind of further field contacts as well, you know, and he he's starting to get a training partner in James Young, who is, you know, he's 336, 337, 500 meter man. And you're starting to think, okay, like not only is he talented, but also the people that he's working with are probably the best in the business um, or one of the best in the business. And I think you're like, okay, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what he can do now going forward. And mate, he's just got, you know, he's just, I guess all pros have, but seems to have his head in the right place. Seems to have really come out um, the other side of, of what was not a bad few years. Cause like he alluded to, he was still, he was still improving, albeit by very, very small margins. And he was still running sort of 146 high, 147. But I think it was just a bit, a bit of a plateau, wasn't it? A bit of a stalemate in his career. Yeah, that's it. And obviously, if he goes on to kind of capitalise on that time he ran at the London Diamond League last year um, and kick on from that again, you, you're, you're an Olympian and then you're you're considering yourself as as one of the best in the world, you know. Um, the, the next step from being a British Olympian is obviously we need some some of these uh, 800 guys in the final, um, get medals um, and we, we're getting there. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I mean, starting to get the predictions in, aren't we? Um, for the year ahead, and I think Botter is someone who will who will be featuring. Uh, and what was what was cool is is we found out as well, you know, how Cram operates, how Cram trains, and very few very few easy days in there, which I think is quite nice to hear. When you know, yeah, sounds like being back on Jeff's training, don't it? <laughs> Well, do you know what? Like, you know, not many people, uh, I guess well, I say not many people, but it's it sounded to me actually very similar to kind of how Jake Whiteman trains mm. as well. Like they do a lot of hard sessions and a lot of actual kind of hard steady running in between as well. And they have one easy run a week pretty much in in kind of, I guess, the winter months. Um, and that easy, they'll be on a Sunday when they do a long run. Everything else is pretty much is pretty hard going. You know, it's not, I, I think Cram, Cram's similar. And I think that that's what worked for Cram and so many people back in the day. And I think he, he still believes in it now. And I think Brot, Botterill was obviously enjoying that as well. Yeah, I think he's enjoying it and he's believing in it, which is which is nice to see. And I think having it come from Steve Cram must be quite quite impactful because I think there's so many of these trends now where people are just thinking, oh, well, I have to do this threshold. I have to do like my two sessions a week, like American style, um, like Tuesday, Friday, because that's what everyone's doing. That's what the science says. And yes, the science does say that, but that is not the science. He's not saying that's the only way. It's just saying that that type of training does work in some scenarios or, or in quite a few scenarios, for example, if you do it right. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely the, to, to, I think to go out and like do that on his own, for example, would be a really hard thing to do. But when you're doing it, knowing that actually, like he Cram's said, back in it. Crammy was one of the best in the world, and he and he's and he's done it, and, and so obviously didn't quite achieve the 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 feats of um of Cohen Ovet. But I know a lot of people do consider him as the best of the three still. Mm. Yeah, I think kind of. Yes, yeah, I was going to say talent wise, he was he was just so raw, wasn't he? When I mean, I'm only talking about watching videos here, but mm. um, when you compare him to like Ovet and Cohen, but. Yeah, it's we won't get into that debate, that's for sure. Let's move on. Yeah, uh, it's Josh Kerr when he when he wins this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um li little race tomorrow called uh the Boston Marathon. Um by the time you're listening. And uh and yeah, so that'll be we got some I mean the lineups are stellar, to be honest. It's gonna be a great race. I'm looking forward to 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 watching it, to be honest with you. Obviously, no no British interest at all. A lot of Americans, a lot of Ethiopians and Kenyans. I think a lot of Ethiopians and Kenyans trying to fight for their spot on on the team. Um, Cisse Lemma, 2148. He ran that in Valencia, December. So he kind of heads the lineup. We've got Evans Chibet. He's the guy who's won it multiple times already. Gabriel Gay as well. So you've got three men, 203, 203 and below, which is just, you know, ridiculous. Um, and on the women's side, Lam, what are the, the women's side's pretty deep as well, isn't it? Of course. Yeah, you got that um Tadu Tosomi. Apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Um a two seventeen. 
Um, and then he walked Gabriel Mayhem as well, 217 as well. Um, I was just looking at like the overall fields though, like nine women sub 220 and 20 men sub 210 is um is a pretty mouthwatering prospect. Obviously, though, Boston, Boston's one thing, but we know London, London's the one, isn't it? And and just just to uh to give you guys a heads up, we'll be doing a kind of full London Marathon preview episode next week sometime. So probably come out Tuesday. Um that's the plan at the moment, isn't it, Matt? Obviously, as we know, sometimes things come in a way, but I think I think it should be Tuesday. Um, so look look out for that one. Yeah, mate, we'll get we'll get a deep, a deep London dive going uh sort of early next week and then i think we're, we're going to have a nice big review episode as well as soon as that team's announced i think that team will be selected what monday tuesday and then it will probably be announced there'll be an appeals period as well potentially so i think there might be a slight delay to that team being announced so but we'll hopefully coincide that with a, with a big old review of the of the biggest marathon in the world um so we look forward to that and yeah podium podium 5k dalich is going to go down next weekend as well on on saturday fastest course in the world it's being labeled as Did you put that in brackets long <laughs> mate uh, I, I think uh, from what i've heard of, of that of that park run um chris, chris i'm gonna be there been, so i'll i'll be the judge i think been uh, saying been saying it's very quick um yeah i i just think it, it, it it's got to be one of the quickest courses out there you know um yeah I think clear roads. Well, you know, park run. You have to weave through a few, um, through a few people on that second lap, don't you? So yeah, that's what I mean. Like I, I think, considering the times they they knock out there, doing kind of laps with, with obviously a park run, as you as as everyone listening will know, like can can be quite tough. I think on on a clear course, um, we'll see when we obviously that's that's an ASICS event as well. Um, so maybe we'll see some people all wearing those new uh, Meta Speed <laughs> Sky Paris editions. Certainly will. Certainly will. And then uh, just a couple other races to look out for. I say it as low-key as that, but Diamond League is going to take place on a weekend as well. So, so much going down on the weekend, the 20th, 21st next week. Um, that's the one in Jarman. I think Ethan Hussey was the only kind of notable Brit get, getting out there and getting after it. in A stacked 800, to be fair. Marco Aerop's going to be out there and a load of other fast guys. And uh, Kip Karno Classic as well. I only say that because... I swear we usually see a few crazy 1500s pop out of that meet early doors, like Chariot goes and runs a 331 at altitude or or that, you know, Abel Kipsang guy. And we're all like, oh my God, what can they do at sea level when they don't get much quicker? So we might see some see some fast times. Actually, Lum, the Olympic kits. Surely oh, mate, that. they are shocking. <laughs> you think Nike is the, the, wor- the worst I've seen for a long time, those Nike kits. And... Do you know what I don't? Do you, know, do you actually? I, I oh, don't yeah. like the fact that the vest and shorts is different to the to the speed suit. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like the speed suit or the or the lycra top or yeah. like you know the kind of. But it's been it's been way. similar for the past um, for, with the GB kit already. Like it looks very different. It looks different. But it's, it's like, yeah, but it's been it's even worse now the way they've changed it. Um, and it. yeah, it's it's really really poor. I think, and, and the worst thing is, obviously, as we know, anyone who follows the kits knows your Olympic kit. That's your kit for four years now. It's not like football; you don't get a new one next year. Uh, mm. So that's just what we're going to have to look for. We're going to have to see, like. I just think, like, I think last last round they did that Kenyan kit so well with oh, the the all over pattern, pattern on the shorts as well, and then now it's literally some random red thing with like this splash of yellow in the middle of the chest. Apparently, it is a like it is a, a, a light green. I, I think it is a light green. I think some of the photos we've seen have been like maybe the lighting was a bit off or something. Yeah. But it is a shame that they've kind of they have kind of played around with the colorways a little bit. It's like don't get me started on that England away kit being purple. I think that's disgusting. Yeah, that is a shambles. The mockery of our nation, mate. Red and white, just call it there. Well, we're just better in a red kit, aren't we? Yeah, we are. The, mate. the, the red, the red, fine, red England like... away kit is even more of like a kind of a classic than and the white i think i know what uh, uh, i don't know why we just don't have red and white every single year like yeah. why are we ch- why are we changing nations colors like it's, it's even clubs to be fair as well i, think, I hate, like I hate club, clubs changing it as well I yeah don't, I don't it, all the big clubs have like a an away kit that is associated with them yeah you know and yeah, mess around with those third kits or like if you're around with you get a fourth kit yeah. um 
So yeah, literally. That's all right, though. That's all right. Though. Yeah. Inca clean, man. Um, so so they're the we act well, we haven't seen the GB kit yet, so we'll hold our breath. I think Puma have uh, unveiled a few a, f a few kits. Yeah, as well. of course Maybe. the GB kit will be will be Adidas, so it might be it might be better. I think it will, man. Adidas are doing some I I, I love the simplicity of their elite kit at the moment, some clean yeah. designs. So let's see what they I think that's they that's the nice thing is when we when we come to Olympics, we get that kind of that bespoke Adidas kit that is is not just a a mock up of of whatever the um the Nike pro design is. Yeah, like Nike, yeah. Nike, that'll be the pro kit will be that design now for this yeah. year. And then yeah, they'll, we'll, they'll just have a pro color and everyone's got that. And it's just a bit of a shame really. Like the Olympics is such a big thing. And like look, obviously going to the champs, whatever, that is the big thing. Like don't get me wrong. But I think everyone listening can appreciate that athletes love getting kit. Like getting the vest itself is Part of going to the Olympics and doing your kit check in and all that, but if you you go and you get some random thing like that, yeah, not sure, not sure. Yeah, we we love a kit, mate. We love a kit. So I think the designs all right, but the colors. I just don't like the fact. Yeah, like I said, there's differences between the vest and if you wear like a speed suit or a singlet or for a woman a crop top. I like, just keep it all the same for God's sake. Um, but yeah, but the USA one looks like the GB one in the speed suit. Yeah, it, it really does. It's the same color. I know, obviously, we're going to be an Adidas for the Olympics, but then next year at World Champs, yeah, surely that the GB and USA are going to be the same kit, essentially. I'd like to see GB in a bit more of a white kit. To be honest, my favorite GB vest was uh, Beijing. Trying to think back to that one. Just clean. I like I like those Adidas ones, like 2011 Daegu. Yeah, that was sick. Yeah, Farah in that. That's what I think of when I think of like GB kit. Yeah, I did rate that. I do rate the Adidas kits. Okay, mate. Well, there we go. We've digressed a bit, but um, important topic to uh, to discuss, I'm sure. So, well, blimey, busy week ahead. So we look forward to it, and we'll we'll catch you next time. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. We'll catch you very soon.